went back to Thailand to ordain. One of the first things that John Fung said to me was that if I wanted to learn the Dharma, I was going to have to learn how to think like a thief. In other words, I couldn't expect to have everything explained, everything handed to me on a platter. If I wanted to learn the Dharma, I had to be observant. After all, how does a thief think? Suppose a thief is going to plan to rob a house. He can't go up and knock on the door and ask the owners of the house when they're going to be away so that he can conveniently come in and steal what they have. He has to case the joint. Hide out, watch, see when they come, see when they go, what doors they leave open, what windows they leave open, where they keep their valuables. And only then can he have any, any hope of stealing the valuables and getting away. And there's a purpose in this. He wasn't just playing a game. Because one of the basic skills you need as a meditator is to be observant. You're not going to gain discernment simply by following directions. There are meditation techniques that give you directions, say, do this, do that, and somehow automatically you're going to gain insight just by following the directions. It's like expecting to get genuine food out of a food processing plant. What you actually end up with is meditation product, like the food products that have so little food that they have to, by law, label themselves as food product. You got the semblance of discernment, the semblance of insight, but not the real thing. The real thing has to come from within your ability to notice things. And this fits in with Aristotle's definition of intelligence, the ability to see connections that nobody else had pointed out to you. That, after all, was the Buddha's insight on the night of his awakening. He saw connections that nobody else had ever pointed out to him. Connections between craving, ignorance, and stress and suffering. All those connections of dependent core arising. Those are things he observed. Because he thought like a thief, didn't expect the truth to be handed to him on a platter. The thing is, the truth is there to be seen at all times, if only you have the mind to observe it. And so as I stayed with the John Fung, it wasn't just a matter of listening to Dharma talks. In fact, he gave very few Dharma talks. You'll probably count all the Dharma talks I heard from him during those ten years on the hands of on, excuse me, on the fingers of two hands. If you asked him a question, he would give you an answer. Sometimes the answers are detailed when he felt that you needed a long explanation. Other times they're very short. Sometimes he wouldn't answer at all. He'd leave you to go back and think out the answer. This is the way John Lee had trained him. And you look at the Ajahns who talk about their time with Ajahn Mun, and it was how Ajahn Mun taught his students as well. He wanted them to be observant, to learn how to think and observe on their own. So keep this point in mind. You have to learn how to use your eyes and ears in new ways. As the chant pointed out just now, most of us use our eyes and ears as flamethrowers. What we see, what we hear, is only what fits inside our own ideas, what fits in with our greed, anger, and delusion. In other words, there's actually more coming out our ears and eyes than there is coming in. More in terms of suppositions, preconceptions, likings and dislikings. And even when we try to be perfectly non-reactive, the fires of delusion come out our eyes. 
those three times mess, as the Buddha said. In equanimity, in non-reactivity, there is what he calls the asava, or effluent, of ignorance. So even when we think that we're being very calm, we still don't see anything because there's more energy going out our eyes than there is coming in. So as with so many things in the Buddhist path, what we have to do is take our eyes, which we've been using in the wrong way, taking our ears, every one of our senses, and applying them to a new use. Learning how to be observant starts with learning how to observe our own actions, the results of our actions. And observing the teacher. Maybe not everything the teacher does is an embodiment of the Dharma, but there's a lot there that is. And so it's for you to figure out which is the Dharma, which is not. Which is a good lesson and which is not. If you don't take an interest in this, there's all the Dharma that's being displayed around all the time. Not only in the teacher's behavior, but in the behavior of everything around you in terms of cause and effect. It's being proclaimed at all times, and yet you don't notice. You're too busy throwing flames with your senses, throwing flames with your mind. Sometimes only you are the one burned, but sometimes it goes out and burns people around you. So think about this. How do you use your eyes? It all starts with your intentions. Are you using them simply for enjoyment, or are you using them to learn, to observe? The same principle applies with all your senses. The mind spends so much time creating worlds for itself. This is what's called the process of becoming. Can you turn it around and devote it to the the project of learning how to understand that process of becoming so you can put an end to it. It all comes down to your intention. Do you really want to see, or do you just want to play with your likes and dislikes? This is an important issue. As we come to practice the Dharma, it's our true happiness is at stake. This is what the Buddha's teachings are. It's a serious pursuit of true happiness. And what gets in the way is our old ways of pursuing happiness. The ones that we're used to, they don't give very satisfactory results, which is why we're here, trying to find something better. But even then, we keep falling back into our old ways, seeing what we want to see, not seeing what we don't want to see. And as a result, the Dharma that's being proclaimed all the time in the behavior of everything around you doesn't have a chance to get in. There's too much energy flowing out the senses. Not much coming in. So this is what makes all the difference. Your willingness to be observant. Your willingness to learn new things. After all, as the Buddha said, this is a project and we're trying to attain what we've never attained before, to see what we've never seen before, to realize what we've never realized before. And if you simply keep looking at things the old way, acting the old way, thinking the old way, nothing new has a chance to come in. So try to get some control over this flame producer, this fire producer. It's the Buddha's image for clinging. Clinging, when we say the word clinging, it calls to mind the idea that we've got a hand that's holding on to an object. Clinging is actually de defined as desire, passion for activities. They feel desire, passion for form, feeling, perceptions, thought formations, consciousness, all of which are activities. We feed off of these things the way the fire, a fire feeds off of fuel. And then we get stuck on these things. 
the way a fire is stuck in its fuel. The basic image the Buddha uses here, of course, you know the word nirvana, the fire goes out. When it goes out, it's freed because it lets go. It stops doing those things. It's an end of a, of a process that causes suffering. So if you want to see the Dharma, you have to look at this habit the mind has of clinging to things, wanting things to be a certain way. And as a result, not seeing what's there to be seen at all times. The Dharma is said to be a kaliko. It's present all the time. But we're not looking. We're too busy churning out fires. Even our equanimity is a fire, because it's bound up with ignorance. The only way to get around that is to make up your mind. You want to be very, very observant. Think like a thief. Not because the Dharma is not being freely offered. It is being freely offered. It's there all the time. But it's only by thinking like a thief can you get around your old habits of not wanting to see. That sway, if you actually can get around those old habits, then your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Instead of being channels for defilement, turn around and become channels of knowledge. That's how we see and realize and attain what we've never seen, realized, or attained before.